The General Dynamics F-111 was not just any other aircraft of the Cold War. It was born as part of the Tactical Fighter Experimental Program ordered by Robert McNamara himself to create a plane that could fit roles requested by both the Navy and the Air Force. The F-111 had a troublesome beginning in the 60s, and at the heart of it was an old grudge between the military branches. Like many of its colleagues at the Epoch, the F-111 had unique innovations and cons that left the two branches divided. Although the Navy despised it, the USAF loved it. Conceived as a fighter, bomber, and interceptor, the F-111 pioneered the concept of using variable sweep wings, terrain-following radar, and afterburning turbofan engines that were unique for its time. It successfully served during the critical years of the Vietnam War, Operation El Dorado Canyon in the 80s, and Operation Desert Storm during the Gulf War. Called the Aardvark, or Earth Pig, for its long nose, the last F-111s were retired from the USAF in 1996 and in 2010 by the Australian Air Force after a 40-year-long career that spanned various combat configurations. McNamara's Plane In May 1960, an American CIA U-2 spy plane conducting a reconnaissance mission over the Soviet Union to gather intel on the latest Russian activity was shot down at over 60,000 feet by an S-75 surface-to-air missile. The U.S. was surprised at how the Soviet air defenses took down the aircraft at such a distance. The new missiles could easily reach American high-altitude bombers. The USAF decided it was time for a small, long-range supersonic fighter to fly close to the ground to avoid being detected by enemy radars. The Strategic Air Command agreed that a new low-level penetration fighter was required. Simultaneously, the Navy was also on the hunt for a long-range carrier-based interceptor armed with heavy air-to-air -air missiles to eliminate anti-ship missiles launched from Soviet fighters and bombers. While both branches were on the lookout for their new designs, President Kennedy's Defense Secretary, Robert McNamara, envisioned that one aircraft could fulfill both the U.S. Air Force and the Navy's requirements. This way, millions of dollars could be saved by focusing only on one multi-purpose airplane. Both branches disliked the idea, but they were forced to cooperate. The result was the Tactical Fighter Experimental, or TFX, program. McNamara chose General Dynamics for developing the aircraft and appointed the USAF as the program manager. However, to make things even, the secretary himself based the design on common ground. Both branches agreed that the aircraft would need to carry heavy armament and fuel loads, feature high supersonic speed, twin engines, two seats, and variable geometry wings. Nevertheless, differences quickly distanced the Navy from the project. While they wanted a high-altitude interceptor with side-by-side -side seating for both men to share the radar display, the USAF preferred a tandem seat configuration for low-level penetration ops. To make matters worse, McNamara's plane, as the Navy began to call it, was to be primarily based on the USAF's configuration, with a modified version for the Navy's needs. The sailors felt humiliated and would never pardon receiving a second-place preference. The F-111 The prototype was dubbed F-111 with variants A and B for each branch. It was powered by Pratt & Whitney TF-30 P-1 turbofan engines with innovative afterburner technology. At the Navy's request, it had a side-by-side -side configuration seating in an escape capsule. In case of an emergency, the pod worked like a space capsule. A rocket would boost the pod away from the aircraft and float to the ground on a parachute. The fuselage was designed with the capacity to accommodate the fuel necessary for long-range missions of up to 3,000 miles and a bomb load capacity of 30,000 pounds. To reach the desired speeds, General Electric and Grumman engineers that later joined the project adopted the swing wings or variable geometry configuration for the F-111. This new technology allowed the wings to swing out at the time of takeoff to increase lift and then tuck inward during mid-flight to attain higher speeds. Another feature of the F-111 was a terrain-following radar system connected to the autopilot that mapped the surface to avoid a collision, automatically adjusting the flight path. The radar satisfied the USAF, which allowed the aircraft to fly as close as possible to the ground to avoid being detected by enemy radar equipment. It also became advantageous when flying at night or in bad weather with minimum visibility. The F-111 could also carry a removable 20mm M61 cannon with a 2,000 ammo tank, two M117 bombs, or a tactical nuclear weapon at the bomb bay. Additionally, the aircraft was equipped with four underwing pylons with a capacity of 5,000 pounds. Either missiles or fuel drop tanks could be fitted. The F-111A, the USAF's version, performed exceptionally well during testing. It was able to fly at Mach 2.5 speeds at high altitude and 1.3 at low altitude. Nevertheless, Things went sideways with the Navy's F-111B. The Navy backs out. The F-111B was mediocre at best. 
It did not fit the role the Navy intended to have since the very beginning. The aircraft was too big and too heavy to be an effective fighter. It was a flying tank that Navy pilots did not like. Veteran pilot George Merritt, who had more than 180 combat missions in Vietnam aboard A-1 Sky Raiders, was one of the test pilots who felt the F-111B was too clunky and ineffective for the Navy's needs. In his book, Testing Death, Merritt wrote that the F-111B was, quote, grossly underpowered and had poor cockpit visibility for a fighter. I wouldn't want to maneuver one against a fighter, but purely as an interceptor, it would have done well against bombers and cruise missiles. Secretary McNamara resigned in February 1968, at the height of the Vietnam War, when the North Vietnamese launched the Tet Offensive that surprised the American forces in the country. The Navy saw this as an opportunity to get rid of the McNamara plane. They did so in a March hearing before the Senate Armed Services Committee. According to author Robert Bernier, who thoroughly studied the F-111B's development, Vice Admiral Tom Connolly replied to a committee member at the hearing, quote, Senator, there isn't enough power in all Christendom to make that airplane what we want. With that response, Congress declined to approve further funds for the aircraft, which had escalated from $3 million to $8 million per plane. The Navy F-111 was later cancelled. USAF Deployments Although useless for the Navy, the F-111 went on to have a successful career with the USAF. During the linebacker raids of 1972, the USAF's F-111 showed the effectiveness of their low-altitude capabilities and the terrain radar use at night. Like a relentless night predator, the aircraft destroyed NVA airfields and air defense batteries with relative ease. F-111s were also tasked with sinking the Cambodian Khmer Rouge in 1975 when it captured the container ship SS Mayaguez. In the more than 3,800 combat missions that the F-111s ran in Vietnam, only six were lost, making it one of the lowest loss rates of the war. The Air Force F-111 saw combat once again in 1986, when President Reagan decided it was time to retaliate against Libyan dictator Muammar al-Gaddafi after he ordered his agents to kill two U.S. servicemen in a Berlin nightclub. Reagan ordered an attack on Gaddafi's private compound near Tripoli. It was one of the first attempts of taking down a head of state by a ferocious air attack. The mission was designated Operation El Dorado Canyon. A squadron of 18 F-111s with heavy ordnance was dispatched to Tripoli to reduce the compound to ashes. Aided by four EF-111s modified and equipped with electronic warfare assets to disrupt enemy radars, the aircraft made their way to the objective. Although the facility was heavily bombed, the Libyan dictator managed to escape with his family at the last minute. Years later, the f 111 saw action once again in Operation Desert Storm during the Gulf War. During the critical days of January 1991, F-111s took the most out of their low-altitude capabilities to hunt down Iraqi SAM sites to clear the way for other American aircraft. When Package Q was launched to bomb the city of Baghdad, where Saddam Hussein was stationed with the Republican Guard, electronic warfare F-111s became a vital part of the massive coalition airstrike, jamming enemy air defense systems. Overall, 80 F-111s with various combat configurations were deployed in the Gulf War, flying over 5,000 missions. The Australian Pig The USAF has sold the F-111C exclusively to Australian Air Forces since 1973. To the Aussies, the F-111 became known as the Pig for the aircraft's long snout and its terrain-following activity. The F-111C had longer wings and a strengthened undercarriage. It became the most powerful aircraft in all of Southeast Asia. In March 2006, four Australian F-111s were ordered to sink the North Korean freighter Pong Su, which had been smuggling heroin into Australia since 2003. Using two 2,000-pound GBU-10 LGBs, the F-111 sent the Asian vessel to the bottom of the sea, displaying their influential role as anti-shipping strikers. The Australian F-111s were finally retired in 2010. Aftermath Although the U.S. Navy never flew the F-111, the Air Force made good use of it during its entire career, often modifying it for various combat roles. The USAF took more than 500 to serve in fighter, bomber, interceptor, and electronic warfare tasks. It excelled in most of them. Like most airplanes of its time, the F-111 had some innovative features that took their time to be perfected and used for combat, such as the radar systems, the unique wing design, and the turbofan engines. But in the end, every one of them paid off. From Vietnam to Australia and the Middle East, McNamara's plane and its multiple and versatile configurations and different versions went on to serve for more than 30 years. To this date, it remains a controversial topic when joint-use aircraft or multi-purpose planes are designed, as more often than not, they tend to fail. The F-111 was not one of them. In the end, Navy officers agreed that it was not a bad aircraft. It simply was not enough for the combat role they desired to have. <laughs>